Hi, welcome to Lagoons Do a Better TV, where we provide bite-sized segments that help your lagoon do it better. I'm Patrick Hill, here with my colleague, Tom Doherty. Um, we're going to talk today about lagoon uh, hydraulic fracturing lagoons and how to treat that wastewater. Uh, hydraulic fracturing has become a, a major uh, boom in the United States, uh, obviously, as you've no doubt heard in the, in the news, and with that comes with a lot of wastewater challenges. And so we're going to talk about how we solve those challenges. Tom um, actually has done a, a few projects in this regard and somewhat of our resident expert, he actually got an article published in this magazine here in regards to how to treat this wastewater. So without further ado, Tom, what would you say, uh, where does this water come from? Well, uh, fracking needs water to open up the, uh, the earth and mm -hmm. they use sand as a propent to hold these holes open. So the flow back water uh, in fracking is when they first shoot the well they have water that comes right back as flowback water, and that will take anywhere from two and a half to five million gallons per well. Mm -hmm. And then once they have that hole drilled and they get down to the hydrocarbons, then there's produced water that comes back on a, on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. So literally the water that comes back out of the hole is a combination of what they call flowback and produced water, or frack water is mm -hmm. the catch-all. Mm -hmm. So with the frack water there, oftentimes they will store some on-site or truck it to water pits uh, that are off-site within 10 to 20 to 50 mile radius, but the closer the better mm -hmm. for trucking costs and whatnot. And so it takes all that water, that two and a half to five million gallons, that's gotta go somewhere, and trucks are just hauling that off constantly, and then it, it sits in a water pit and it needs some sort of a treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are the challenges with this type of water? What's in it and, and how, is it, how, how do they typically go about treating it? Well, it's somewhat of a $64,000 question on what's exactly in it, because a lot of the different drillers have different chemicals that are proprietary and they won't say. Mm -hmm. But we did some work up in, in Utah, we can't name the location, uh, but we did some work up in Utah and we did some advanced water chemistry on a, a frac flowback pond, flowback and produced water pond, uh, before we put in a Mars aeration system. Mm -hmm. And so we had baseline chemistry, and what we did find in there is a lot of hydrocarbons, but things that are uh, recalcitrant type things like BTEX, mm -hmm. the, the acronym BTEX, B-T-E-X, is benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene is mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's some of the stuff you see in the flowback water. Mm -hmm. So what's their current strategy for treating it? What do they do with this water right now? So uh, they were trying to evaporate it, mostly up in, in Utah and in Texas and some of the other shale plays, they're, they're trying to evaporate it a lot, but reuse is where the pendulum has been swinging most recently because mm -hmm. that's a lot of water and you need a lot of new water every time for another well. So we did install a system up there to begin to uh, pre-treat that water with mm -hmm. the, the fine bubbles and getting the oxygen in it in order to make it eligible for downhole reuse is the first line of reuse, mm -hmm, you know, sure. is downhole, Absolutely. as opposed to irrigating crops, because there's a lot of chlorides in this water as mm -hmm. well. And aeration doesn't, doesn't touch chlorides necessarily. So what are the benefits of uh, aeration in a lagoon like that? Well, what we've seen after we had that baseline chemistry is we operated for just 14 days straight. At the end of 14 days, we had reductions in benzene of 54%, toluene of 39%, xylene of, of 52%. Wow. So that was a significant reduction in that short period of time. And the other thing that we did up there that we began experimenting with, and, and we ran into some complications with weather, is online monitoring. What, mm -hmm. we're, what we're trying to go with the business model at the time there was to show the downhole reuse guy the instant water quality at that particular water pit, and they could look at that online and decide, hey, I'll use that for reuse down my hole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool, so how does aeration specifically achieve these reductions? Well, the pond that we went in up in uh, Utah was had no treatment at all. And so mm -hmm. we put the aeration units in the bottom of the pond, and so it was filtering up through that 14 foot of water column. And when we put those fine bubbles in there, it began to oxidize a bunch of those contaminants. Mm -hmm. As we know from the literature, fine bubbles will oxidize SRB, sulfate-reducing bacteria, mm -hmm. which is a precursor to H2S, or hydrogen mm -hmm. sulfide, which mm -hmm. is where they have odor issues at the frac ponds, just like they have at the city that gets H2S, even sure. the municipal wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So we begin to reduce all that and oxidize that and improve the water for the next level of potential reuse. So mm -hmm. oxygen, the fine bubbles and the mixing really brought a lot to the party there. And I will add this too, in that particular uh, pond up in Utah, 
It had never been treated before, and there was a lot of oily hydrocarbon sludge in the bottom. And when we put this system in, and we turned it on, mm -hmm. we created foam, as you often mm -hmm. do when you start up a wastewater treatment plant, because sure. you're you're oxidizing anaerobic bacteria right. or surfactants or other things mm -hmm. that's in the bottom layer. But nothing ever being there, and all those hydrocarbons, we created foam like shaving cream foam. Oh wow! I mean, two three. Two three inches foam so on thick. the top. It yeah. started going up the freeboard. We started worrying and talking to the site management that, right. hey, that's going to uh, cause a spill. Right. As well, worst case, we can shut it off, but right. we want this to acclimate. So sure. I think we'll power through it, you know. And we actually did. So it, it kind of bell curved and went through that, and we mm -hmm. oxidized a lot of stuff, and we improved that that water significantly. What are the potential cost savings to frac? fracking, hydraulic fracturing companies by being able to reuse this water versus getting new water? It's, it can be significant because water is not getting any more plentiful out there. We know, you know, from coast to coast of the, the water shortages and droughts in different areas, mm -hmm. although currently we're in a very good winter and the snowpack's looking pretty good in a sure. lot of the western states mm -hmm. anyway that I could speak to. Uh, but water, water is still a, a, a high-priced commodity depending on the market you're in. Some mm -hmm. places it's still kind of cheap. But uh, I don't know that society thinks that's the best use of a pristine mountain water to run down a, 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 fracking, uh, well. a yeah. fracking well. Yeah. So <laughs> if they can reuse that, if they can match the geology, basically of the chloride content in the geology of where they're downhole mm -hmm. versus the available water, we can clean up a lot of the other contaminants uh, with with aeration. And maybe they need to go to another step if they need it cleaner. But aeration certainly acts as a pre-treatment step. Sure, and I, I suppose if you're using new water, you're generating more, generating more wastewater, which then needs to be hauled, and where do you put that? I mean, they're, they're, you're adding water on top of water on top of water there relative to reusing what you have and not increasing your overall water footprint. You're just keeping it the same by, by treating it, reusing it, treating it, reusing it. So I gotta see there's cost savings there. <laughs> um, how does it, how does the, uh, obviously we talked about, you know, use of water, not to use the best pristine water, but just an environmental impact of being able to treat this fracking water. Right. Well, the, and then, again, if you can take less out of the ground fresh water and, this, and reuse water that's already been used in that environment, the downhole uh, well drilling environment, then that's just a net savings to the water cycle. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a social con context to this too because some of the uh, the frackers, the well drillers, have gotten, uh, uh, you know, you can look on social media and they're you're poisoning our water and flames come out of our our uh, faucets and this mm -hmm. sort of thing. However, we still like to heat our buildings. We still like to drive our vehicles and gas. So we mm -hmm. got to get that somewhere, right? Sure. So well, there's got to be a happy medium, a responsible capitalism there. And so this is probably one of the most inexpensive ways that a frack flowback pond could at least do some level of treatment, doing mm -hmm. aeration as opposed to, uh, you know, some electrocoagulation, reverse osmosis, and some, some other uh, treatment cycles. And, and so I think that uh, meets some sort of a social more sure, that, that, that they're investing into that. And I, yep. I think that, that helps the, uh, the message a little bit. Yeah, the perception. Well, thanks, Tom, for talking to us about this today. If you've got any questions for Tom, feel free to comment on this video. Uh, we're going to continue doing videos like this. And, you know, we also set up a Facebook group. And we have our blog online, which does similar topics to this, where we're constantly writing on Lagoon topics. So subscribe to those things. And if you subscribe to those things and our YouTube channel here, we'll send you a free hat. So um, I hope you do. Um, thank you for joining us today, and we'll speak to you next time.